Get A. Why is negative times negative positive? It's an age-old question. Every school student asks this question and should ask this question because it's quite befuddling. And rarely is a satisfactory answer to it ever given. So let's dig in that today and figure out what's really going on. Why should negative times negative be positive? And to get us going, let's start back at the beginning. Let's do positive times positive. I think we can handle that one. For example, positive 2 times positive 3. Okay, that's going to be positive 6, but why? Well, because in the world of counting numbers, we interpret multiplication as repeated addition. We read this as two groups of three, in which case it really is a three and another three. Two groups of three, and of course three and three together make positive six. Positive times positive is positive. That's all good and clear. No worries there. So let's start introducing some negative numbers. Let's now do positive times negative, say. Let's do, say, two times negative three. Well, if I follow the same reasoning up here, I'm going to interpret this as two groups of negative three. Okay, in which case I'll do a negative 3 and a second negative 3. And negative 3 and negative 3 together make negative 6. So there I'm seeing uh, positive times negative is a negative answer. Grand. All right, let's now do the other one. Uh, let's do negative times positive. Let's do, say, negative 2 times 3. And now we're in a bit of a pickle. Because if I try to interpret this in the counting numbers way as repeated addition, negative 2 groups of 3, my brain says, I don't know what I just said. That makes no sense. Negative two groups or something? I don't know what that means. So I'm feeling stuck. But at this point, most people say, but James, James, you can just switch the numbers around. Multiplication works that way. Oh, does multiplication work that way? That's the belief about multiplication works for all numbers that way. OK, if you want to play that game, I'll go along as well and say, OK, we'll just switch this around. Say this is really the same as 3 times negative 2. And I can now make sense of that. That's three groups of negative two. That's a negative two, and a negative two, and a negative two, and it's negative six. OK, so if I believe I can still switch numbers around in multiplication, even for negative numbers, then I'm forced to say that negative times positive is going to be a negative answer. Great. OK, this is feeling good now. So let's now go to the juicy question, negative times negative. What's negative two times negative three? Great. Can we work that out? Well, negative two groups of negative three no idea what that means. What's negative two groups or something? So you say, OK, we can fix that problem, just switch it around. We like to believe we can switch it, let's do it. So this is really the same as negative three times negative two. And then I get nervous because I've got the same issue. What's negative three groups of negative two? What's negative three groups or something? I have no idea and I'm truly stuck. I know I've been trained to say the answer is positive six, but I want to actually understand why should negative two times negative three be positive six? So, Let's do that. Let's do that next. Let me give a good argument that seems very satisfactory, and then we'll really dig into that argument next. OK, let's even come up with a reason why mathematics wants negative 2 times negative 3 to be positive 6. And I'm going to do that in sort of a sideways way. I'm going to work out this multiplication problem, 17 times 18 instead. But I'm going to do it four different ways. Crazy. All right, the first way. The first way is going to be a standard way. 17 times 18, to me, that's actually uh, figuring out a geometry problem. If I have a rectangle that's 17 units long and 18 units high, then I'm really asking in this multiplication problem, what's the area of this rectangle? To work out the area, you go length times height. That'll be 17 times 18. Working out the area is exactly doing that computation right there. All right, so I'm going to think about areas here. All right, so I'm looking down and want to work out the area of that rectangle. But me being a mathematician, I look at this and say, Ick, ick, I don't like those numbers. I don't like hard work. Can I make those numbers easier and kinder to myself? And my brain says, yes, perhaps think of 17 as a 10 and a 7. So let's chop this rectangle length into 10 units and 7 units and chop the rectangle into two pieces like that. And then we do the same thing with 18, make that friendly with a 10 and an 8. So I'm going to chop the rectangle again horizontally this way. So now I've divided the area into four pieces. All I have to do is work out the area of each individual piece, add them up, have the area of the whole rectangle. In which case, I have the, area, the answer to our multiplication problem. Great, so let's do it. So this piece here is 10 wide and 10 high. That has area 100 units squared. This piece here is 7 uh, long and 10 high. That's 7 times 10. That's 70 units squared. This piece here is 7, 7 by 8. That's the awkward one. I think that's 56 units squared. And this is 10 by 8, 80. Great. So the area of this rectangle is 100 plus 70 plus 80 plus 56. So what is that? 100 plus another 150, that's uh, 250, plus 56 is 306. 17 times 18 apparently equals 306. Great, grand, and good. All right, that's fabulous. So I played with the area model here and got the answer to my multiplication problem. 
And I was a mathematician. I made things kind for myself to avoid some hard work. But also being a mathematician, I like to play and make things quirky. And here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to let go of this being a picture about geometry, literally about geometry. I'm going to make it a picture about arithmetic. So I'm going to let go of my geometry mindset and play with the number 17 in a different way. Instead of thinking it was 10 and 7, I'm going to be extra quirky and think it was 20 and negative 3. I'll keep the 18 the same. I'll keep that 10 and 8. All right. So this is not a picture from geometry. You cannot have negative side lengths in geometry. You can't have negative areas in geometry. So do not think of this as a statement about geometry. But do think about a statement. It is a statement of arithmetic. And let's see if the arithmetic is still working out. So here's the statement of arithmetic. Let's work at individual pieces. 20 times 10 is 200. Uh, negative 3 times 10, or 10 times negative 3. We're going to carry that, positive times negative. That's, that's 10 groups of negative 3, and that's going to be negative 30. That one we're okay with. Uh, 20 times 8 is 160, and uh, 8 groups of negative 3, I believe, is negative 24. Let's now add up these pieces. I've got 200, another 160, that's 360. Take away 30, 330. Take away 24, 330 take away 24 is 306. So yes, this picture, not a picture of geometry, but a picture of arithmetic, is giving me the right answer. It is truth in arithmetic. Love it. OK, so let's keep playing. Rather than be quirky with the 17, I'll keep that one the same this time. But this time, I'll be quirky with the 18. Think of that as 20 and negative 2. Do I get 306 again? Do you know what? I bet I do. Let's check it. Uh, this piece is going to be 10 times 20, 200. 7 times 20, 140. This is lovely. 10 times negative 2. 10 groups of negative 2 is negative 20. We can handle that. And 7 groups of negative 2 is negative 14. And what have we got? Uh, 200, 340. Take away 20, 320, take away 14, 306. All right. So yes, these pictures are speaking truth in arithmetic. They're a bit weird if you've got your geometry brain on, but as arithmetic pictures, the information here is fabulous. So 17 times 18, it's 306, it's 306, 306. The answer is going to be 306. Because you can guess what I want to do now. I want to be quirky with both numbers, both the 17 and the 18. Let's think of 17 as 20 and negative 3. Let's think of 18 as 20 and negative 2. And then I can do my individual pieces. This piece will be 20 times 20. That's 400. This piece is 20 groups of negative 3. That's negative 60. This piece is uh, 20 groups of negative 2, negative 40. And the reason I like this, because this now gives us our very problem to work out. Negative 2 times negative 3. We don't know what that is. I know I've been trained to say positive 6. But let's see what the arithmetic is forcing us to say. What does the math want negative 2 times negative 3 to be? It wants that num that, some number there to give the answer 306. And if you look at this, what we've got so far is we've got 400. We've got minus 100. That's 300. But the answer is meant to be 306. We've got no choice but to say that has to be positive 6 in that cell right there. Negative 2 times negative 3 has to be positive 6. Math wants that to be the case. Negative times negative to be positive in this case. Negative 2 times negative 3 has to be positive 6. There it is. But let's really deep dive into, this, into what's going on here. What's really happening? Let's explore what's really happening. We'll do that next. What's really going on here is a beautiful interplay between multiplication and how we like to visualize multiplication through rectangular arrays. For example, here's a picture of 6 times 8, 6 groups of 8. And I've drawn a group of 8, another group of 8, 6 groups of 8 as horizontal rows to get a rectangular array of dots to show 6 times 8. And there are 48 dots in that picture. OK, grand, that's good. So there's a lovely picture of 6 times 8. But I, then I can play with this picture. For example, I could actually chop this rectangle into two pieces like that and say, oh, oh, it's really a picture of 6 by 5 together with 6 by 3. So I could say, OK, this has to be 6 by 5 plus 6 by 3. OK. Or if I want to chop my rectangle a different way, maybe chop it a little horizontally this time and think of the 6 as really 4 and 2, I can say, oh, these 48 dots are really as well this piece, which is 4 by 5, and this piece, which is 4 by 3, and this piece, which is 2 by 5, and this piece, which is 2 by 3. And I can keep going. Maybe I want to chop again. I want to chop again. I could chop this rectangle as many pieces as I like and say, OK, the total area, the total region of that rectangle is actually all these individual pieces added together. Now, you caught me just then. I almost said the word area, because most people think of this as the area model. 
Instead of drawing dots, draw unit squares. Okay, squares of area one, in which case, yes, this uh, six by eight really would be the area of this rectangle. So I'm not gonna stop draw all these rectangles here. But there we go. You could actually say this is a picture of unit squares instead of dots and say this is really about geometric area instead. All right, great. Well, the danger of that is it's really about geometric area. That means you've got a geometric mindset going on. But you want to loosen this. So here's the belief. Here's the belief. We like to believe from pictures like this, be they unit squares or dots, that we can chop up rectangles any way we like and rewrite sums as sums of pieces. All right. So that's, called a, that's a belief about numbers, a belief. Most people call that the distributive rule. I'm going to call it the chop up rectangles rule. And the reason I'm being a little coy there is because school books only ever state one version of the distributive rule. You've probably seen this. School books will say A times B plus C equals A times B plus uh, A times C, if I can get it right myself. What they're really doing there is saying, giving one example of chopping up a rectangle. That if there's A wide and B plus C long, you can chop it up like this. You get A times B and A times C. So the distributive rule you see in school books is just one tiny application of just chop up a rectangle. Okay, yes, you can prove you can keep chopping up rectangles any way you like on this basic axiom. However, that's how you really use it. You just keep chopping up rectangles into many pieces you like and keep track of all the pieces. Most people call that foil if you've got four pieces, which is terrible because what do you do with six pieces or eight pieces? Foil doesn't work. I just say chop up the rectangle and make sure you take into account each and every piece you've got. Bingo, beautiful. This, this is, the, is what really makes you uh, want to say that negative times negative has to be positive. We take this belief that seems so obvious about the counting numbers and say, actually, that feels like it should be a property that holds for all numbers, all types of numbers, be they fractions or irrational numbers or even negative numbers. So we like to take that as a basic belief about how numbers work. In which case, if you're playing this belief game, there's going to be logical consequences. And of course, one of those consequences we've seen already is that negative times negative has to be positive. But let me go through that in a very sort of a axiomatic way this time to show what's really going on that doesn't just rely on pictures, what's really happening behind the scenes. But I need to clean the board. Okay, so let me clean up this uh, board here and I'll be back in just a moment. Okay, let's play with some logical consequences of believing the distributive rule works for all types of numbers. It holds for everything. All right, as a starting point for my play, I'm going to say uh, 2 times 0 is 2 grips of 0. 0 plus 0, that is actually 0. We'll make that our starting point for right now. Because what I want to do now is be sneaky and rewrite 0 right there. In fact, I think of that as 3 plus negative 3. Okay, so if I'll believe that line, then I have to believe that 2 times 3 plus negative 3 has to be 0. That's still 0, just the previous line rewritten. All right, but it looks like I'm now thinking of a rectangle that's 2 by... 3 plus 3, so there's 2 and 3, and sorry, and negative 3. So I'm splitting that rectangle into two pieces, so I can say, ah, if the distributive rule holds for all types of numbers, I can apply it right here and say this is the same as 2 times 3 and 2 times negative 3. Great, and that would still have to be 0 because technically I've changed nothing from one line to the next. Okay, now I can see 2 times 3 is 6, I've got that, and I've got this 2 times negative 3, and that's meant to equal 0. Now, I know we said earlier that 2 times negative 3 is just two copies of negative 3. That should be uh, negative 6. But you know what? I can see it has to be negative 6 right now. I can see 6 plus something is 0. That something better be negative 6. So actually, believing that positive times negative is also negative is a consequence of the distributive rule. All right. All right. So that's the sort of game I want to play. Um, let me play it again uh, with a different starting point. But I'm going to clean the board back in just a moment. Alright, let's now play with this statement. Zero times anything should be zero. Zero times negative three in particular should be zero. Alright, let's play with that one. And let's uh, be sneaky with how we think about the zero right here. Let's think of that as two plus negative two. Alright, okay. Two plus negative two, that zero times negative three should still be zero according to that previous line right there. Alright. Now it looks like I'm chopping up a rectangle. I've got a rectangle that's 2 and negative 2 and negative 3 on the length. Not a statement about geometry, a statement about arithmetic. So by the distributive rule, this is 2 times negative 3, 2 times negative 3, plus negative 2 times negative 3. Okay, and that should still be 0. 
So I believe this, I'm forced to believe that, if I believe that, I'm then forced to believe this. We just worked out 2 times negative 3. That's negative 6 plus, ah, there's our mysterious thing. Negative 2 times negative 3, I don't know what that is, but I know when I add it to negative 6, I shall get 0. And right there, as a consequence of the distributive rule, I have to say, oh, this has to be 6. Negative 2 times negative 3 just has to be positive 6. This is the true explanation of why negative times negative is positive. It really is a logical consequence of believing that we can chop up rectangles no matter what. The pictures we draw hold for all types of numbers, even if we're not thinking about geometry anymore, all types of numbers, in which case the distributive rule is holding. That one of the logical consequences is that negative 2 times negative 3 has to be positive 6. In fact, negative times negative always has to be positive. Do this more abstractly, you can see that's the case. Whoa! So now you can see why young students aren't really told the true reason why negative times negative is positive. We come up with all these little arguments about, you know, soldiers walking on number lines and walking backwards as they change directions or watching films backwards as you, of trains moving backwards as well. I, I don't know. There's all sorts of things out there trying to explain why negative times negative must be positive. But the true answer is this. It's a logical consequence of a basic belief about numbers. And why should we believe it in the first place? We don't have to. It's a choice we've made. And it seems to all hang together and work beautifully, beautifully and mimic the real world when these, these, these uh, arguments actually have application to a real world scenario. That's the beauty and the wonderful mystery of mathematics. We might say we're just choosing to believe these things, but our beliefs seem to actually model the real world so beautifully well when it's appropriate to use that model. Gotta love math. This is amazing stuff.